This is a UNCG Pedagogical Poetry Society video, and I'm Jesse Morton. Today, we'll be talking about haiku. Let's start with a brief definition and a little bit of historical context. Haiku is a traditional Japanese poetic form, which has been adapted for use in other languages. A Japanese haiku typically has 17 onji, which are symbol sounds, distributed over three phrases, following a 5-7-5 five, pattern. And in Japanese, haiku should include a seasonal word, kaigo, and cutting words, kireji, because syllables in English are not exactly the same as onji, Japanese symbol sounds. English language haiku do not necessarily follow that 575 pattern. And in Japanese, there are other terms for poems that do not exactly do what a haiku is supposed to do. In pre-modern and early modern Japan, the haiku was the opening component of a larger collaborative poetic endeavor. In a time before Pixar didn't happen, haiku were like snapshots to record an experience or memorable scene. As modern Western ideas of ownership and single authorship began to influence other parts of the world, the opening verse, the haiku, became separated from the communal functions of amateur poetry that had existed in early modern and pre-modern Japan. In the past, though, haiku was a highly democratic genre. There are three key concepts to keep in mind when considering haiku. First, the haiku marks a particular social time and space. Second, anyone should be able to compose a haiku. And third, the reader must complete the haiku. This third concept is directly related to the cutting words, which create a sort of gap in the poem's logic. The reader must enter into the cut, the space opened by the poet's word choice, and connect the two parts of the poem for herself. This emphasis on the cutting words is often lacking in English language haiku, but it still occurs in some instances. Similarly, the seasonal word does not have the same function as it does in Japan and is usually ignored. Imagists like Ezra Pound and William Carlos Williams exported the haiku to the West, and North American haiku movement began during the 1950s, and by the 70s and 80s, haiku in English focused on moments of intense perception, especially the sensory aspects of physically small objects or on a particular instant in time. But in traditional Japanese haiku, seasonal words include food and social customs, which are not necessarily nature, and haiku does not have to focus on moments. It can meditate on history, memory, or any other temporal spatial state. It's also important to note that many English language haiku are closer to 14 or even 11 syllables, and haiku poets often try to use as few syllables as possible without losing the meaning or the effect. It's clear that haiku in Japanese are quite different from the haiku we see composed in English. There are similarities, but the emphasis and cultural significance are distinct. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at two different approaches to haiku and consider some ways to explore haiku in the literature classroom. For most types of poems, reading out loud and providing a brief paraphrase of the poem's content can be helpful. These steps can seem silly with such short poems, but I still recommend them, especially for haiku, because they are specifically dependent on units of sound and because their original function was social and collaborative. Matsuo Basho is one of the most well-known writers of traditional Japanese haiku. Here's one example of his work. There are many translations available, but you'll quickly notice that this haiku doesn't have exactly 17 syllables. Like most poetic forms, the haiku form is one that can be adapted to the poet's purpose. In this particular haiku, we have a single vivid image. It captures a moment in time and connects that moment with a particular season. It doesn't just allow for a clever linkage with a collaborator's work. This one stands on its own, even though the meaning is uncertain. As with most haiku, the reader must participate in the creation of meaning. We see this gap after the second line, and that's where the reader must piece things together. The branch in the first line and the crow in the second line are linked by action. But the third line is quite different, opening the poem to further consideration and interpretation. Noticing the cuts can help us see where the reader is invited into these poems. When we read works in translation, we also need to consider the ways in which a translator's choices might affect our reading. 
In one translation, the translator chooses this expression. On dead branches, crows remain perched at autumn's end. The image remains a crow perched on a branch in autumn, but the change from a crow has stopped to crows remain could alter the meaning. This version also reduces the reader's participation because it adds the preposition at. At autumn's end more clearly connects the branch and the crow to the season, and there's less cutting between the lines because this small word choice smooths out the transition. So meaning may be a collaboration between the poet, the translator, and the reader. It can be difficult to consider translation when we have read only one version of the poem in our own language, but traditional haiku reading multiple translations of the same poem can help us see how specific word choices may alter the meaning. Jack Kerouac's American haiku include more instances in which man-made things intrude on the natural world or collide with the natural world in some way. These haiku rarely follow the 17-syllable 575 pattern, but they do create vivid images and invite readers to participate in the making of meaning. Here are a few. Nightfall, too dark to read the page, too cold. Following each other, my cats stop when it thunders. Wash hung out by moonlight, Friday night in May. The bottoms of my shoes are clean from walking in the rain. This set of haiku is taken from a longer series. So while they can potentially stand on their own, they're not generally read in isolation. We can take each of these stanzas individually, or we can consider how they might work together to create a larger image, which calls back to the more traditional collaborative structure of haiku. This example does incorporate elements of the natural world, nightfall, cats, thunder, but it also includes man-made things, pages, the wash hung out, and shoes. There's a sense of meditating on a moment in time, and there are vivid images. To interpret this poem, we might start by finding those spaces where the reader can step into the poem's logic, as we did with Basho's work. There may not be specific cutting words here, but there are plenty of gaps that the reader must fill. One of my favorite ways to incorporate haiku into the classroom, though, is to have students attempt to write haiku of their own. We often see this assumption that poems are written spontaneously, perfect the first time. So asking students to craft a poem with particular formal elements can help them more clearly see poems as creations. To get started, I especially like going outside, going on a walk as a whole class if possible. If going out is not possible, opening the classroom windows can be helpful as well. This kind of assignment can still be difficult for some students. So I always include a reflection component so that students can explain their writing choices and process, even if they aren't confident in their creative writing skills. So they're still able to show their knowledge of the haiku form without having as much pressure on the creative process itself. Whether haiku writing is assigned or not, I hope you'll write some haiku of your own very soon. Thanks for watching, and be sure to check out some of UNCG Pedagogical Poetry Society's other videos.